Father God, we thank you for your word today. And God, I just pray right now as we navigate these truths, Lord, that you will use these few moments to encourage people to come to faith. God, I pray through your words today that lives will be changed forever. God, I thank you for the examples that you have given us today in Simeon and Anna. And Lord, when we navigate this passage today, I pray that it's less of me and more of you that comes out amongst your bride today. Continue to encourage us, continue to correct us, Lord God, as we want to be obedient followers of Jesus. Help us in doing so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so I already told you, with certainty, we have a reason to worship. Every time I preach, I usually spend every morning leading up to the day of actual preaching going over the exact same passage that I've gone over with you guys today, right? The way I, the way I study these things out, I'm, I'm really prideful in a good way. I believe this because I want the Lord to reveal through his spirit what his word means right? In this moment, not because I want it to mean what I want it to mean, but I want it to mean what the Lord has directed me in through his spirit. Just like we see the Holy Spirit moving in Simeon in this passage. I desire that relationship with God for myself through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense to everybody? So pridefully, I go over it and I go over it and I go over it and I go over it. And it's not till later in the week I go, did I get it right? I'm going to research some commentaries or whatever because I don't want to mislead anybody, okay? Now, I've, I've been blessed recently because Stefan and his family are back, and I love these guys, right? And everybody does in here. But Stefan comes over Tuesday mornings real early, 6 a.m. for coffee, right? And so this week he came over, and I said, you know, he, he asked about preparing for the sermon, and I told him where I was at in, in this passage. And, you know, there's an overarching theme of what is going on in this part, right? In Luke 2, we probably all are very familiar with the birth of Jesus, right? The foretelling uh, to, uh, about John the Baptist and the foretelling about baby Jesus, and then he is born, and all these great things that we know about Jesus. And we kind of just read it through kind of like a, a little history book for a moment to hit the high points. And then we get to this point today where you heard about Simeon and Anna, right? Last week, Kenny was talking about um, the, the different presentations of the temple on the eighth day where he goes to get circumcised and all that good stuff, and that's where we're at. That's the same piece. He just broke it up. We put pause last week, and I'm picking up here, right? And I was like, you know, Stefan, I know the overarching theme is God does fulfill his promises. Hundreds of years before, he foretold about Jesus who was coming, right? I get that. These are affirmations of who Jesus is in this moment. We're going to talk about that. But I was like, you know, is there a whole lot more I really need to discuss? I mean, like that's the primary focus of this passage, right? And then literally yesterday, a lot of times I put these together, my, my notes to make it flow a little better. And so I decided to make point number one when the light went off for Sean finally, okay? And the light is this, point number one, we're gonna read Luke chapter one, okay? Verses one, through three or through four, okay? Why did Luke give us this account of Simeon and Anna? Like this is the only gospel that talks about these guys. I'm sitting there going, why? God, what do you want me to know? What am I supposed to get out of this? What's the extra thing than all the overarching pieces? Luke has the answer. Chapter 1, verse 1, in as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. 
That's why he writes about Simeon and Anna. So that you, being just like Theophilus, will have certainty of the account that he is making sure he is preserving from those who are eyewitnesses. Simeon and Anna were literally eyewitnesses of Jesus, and he led them by the Holy Spirit with some very important pieces that we need not to forget, okay? So that way we have certainty with our faith and understanding with God's word. Does that make sense? So in all silliness, the answer's right there in his word. This is why we have the story of Simeon and Anna, all right? So starting with Simeon, we're going to learn a few things about Simeon, right? Simeon was a devout, righteous follower of God, right? Says that in his word. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Consolation of Israel, it can be compared to um, uh, the hope of Israel or the salvation of Israel or, uh, man, there's a word there. Did I write it down? Oh, man, didn't do a good job. But there's a word for consolation that does start with a C that I cannot remember in this moment. Either way, he's anticipating what God had already said he was going to do in saving Israel, right? Oh, comfort, that's it, C word, got it, comfort. Comfort of Israel, Woo! got it. And the reason why Isaiah 40 is one of those that displays this comfort of Israel, okay? A really good reference for you to go back to and just have an understanding. But he's waiting on the comfort of Israel. You got to remember, these guys were in captivity many different times. They needed to be pulled out and saved on multiple occasions by God in the Old Testament. And there's about 400 years passing from the time of Isaiah and Jeremiah, maybe 600 years, whatever that is, a long time. And Simeon is told by the Holy Spirit that you will not die until you see the Lord's Christ. Now, who's the Lord's Christ? Jesus. What is the Lord's Christ? Well, Christ is the anointed one, the one that they totally believe that was going to be coming as the Messiah to save the world. Now, some would have a very selective view that specifically coming to save the people of Israel. But if all of those had a true understanding, they would know that literally he was coming to save all of his people. And Simeon's going to point out what that looks like in just a minute. So Simeon was literally told by God through the Holy Spirit that you will not see death until you see the Lord's Christ. The one that he is sending, sending, as the horn of salvation pointing to Jesus to save his people, to redeem his people, to make a king that will rule his people eternally. That's what Simeon was told. And what Simeon identifies is praise be to God that you fulfilled that in me, I have seen. Second point, salvation is for all peoples. He says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people, Israel. When Simeon is saying that, he's saying that yes, there is a light coming to unveil or undawn or uncover what Paul calls is the mystery of the gospel. That salvation not only was for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles as well, okay? If you look into uh, Romans 1, for 116, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for all who believe, first the Jew, then the Greek, okay? Paul is echoing the exact same things that Simeon is saying right here. Salvation has come for all. It's Jesus. He's the Lord's Christ. And praise be to God, I get to go home. You have fulfilled your promise. Now remember, I already said the overarching theme of this is that God fulfills his promises, right? 
And so Luke is making this tie. You, you got to remember Luke was the physician. I know Pastor Kenny had told us, hey, he's a physician. He's a Gentile. Um, I don't know if he told you this, but he was from Antioch. You know, this is where they were first called Christ, or I'm sorry, first called Christians in Antioch uh, whenever Paul was doing his journeys. And so he hooks up with Paul and he begins to follow and to learn from eyewitness accounts everything that we are seeing being written down today from a very educated individual, Okay. And he's affirming God's word right now in this gospel to not only Jews, but Gentiles, as he is one, right? And he's really want to make sure that Theophilus, Theophilus has the certainty of what is truth. And so he's pre preservation, it's the preservation of God's word that he's most concerned about in sharing all of this, okay? So the overarching theme is that God is the one who will fulfill his promises and that he will be the one who saves his people, that he will do all of that. And Christ is the one that he chose as the anointed one, okay? So thirdly, words to Mary. You see in this passage, these words to Mary, he shares two specific things that are gonna happen, okay? One, this child, meaning Jesus, is appointed for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. Well, you see, the theme behind us has been upside down kingdom, okay? And that could have looked like, oh, the rise and fall, we're going to take over. He's going to conquer as a reigning king, right? But this is an upside down kingdom. Right now, he's coming in. Ultimately, this is a piece about judgment, okay? And the second part, he says, and for the sign that is opposed so that thoughts of many hearts may be revealed and a sword will also pierce through your own soul. The hearts being revealed, think about the leadership at that time. Time and time again, now Jesus is only eight days old when this is happening, but we know, because we have the full word of God, that he continued to present what is truth and really wrecked and showed where the hearts of many people who were leading the nation of Israel were out of whack. We're not God's ways. We're not the intention of God in the way that they were serving Israel and serving God in doing so. And he brought a corrective piece in his speech so much so that many a times they could not believe how Jesus spoke with such great authority before all these leaders. So this piece that he's referencing is there's going to be judgment. There's going to be a rise and fall of many people. Okay? There's going to be this judgment of the hearts. The hearts are going to truly be revealed. What does God do on the day of judgment? He is the one who knows our hearts. Now, in this scenario, there's this piece that is a reference to even Mary's heart being pierced with a sword, that she will suffer the anguish of that. And that, that's like a foretelling piece of what's going to happen to Jesus, right? We know that Jesus goes to the cross. We know that Jesus is hung on the cross for your and my sins, right? He bears the burden, the weight of all of our sins. He's nailed to the cross. He has a crown of thorns placed on his head. He has nails through his feet and his hands. He had the, 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 the lashes uh, on his back. He is pouring out his blood, right? This sacrifice ultimately for you and for me. And in the end, they pierce his side. And his mom is a witness. Mary is the witness this account when the blood pours out like water. And there's anguish of seeing her own child up on the cross. And he's foretelling about this. This is Simeon, right? We can learn a lot from Simeon. He was devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. This man was devoted to God and had the Holy Spirit in his life and responded when the God of our father ultimately spoke to him through the Holy Spirit. He listened. Are you listening to God, the Father, through the Holy Spirit today in your walk, in your faith, in your life? Are you waiting as Simeon was waiting for the coming of the Christ? Are you waiting for the return of Christ? Anna, two things I want to share with you about Anna. 
Was she devout? Oh, heck yeah. We got this old lady. She was up in age. 84 years of age, maybe. Maybe she was a widow for 84 years. We don't know the exact, that translation piece right there. But she could have been a widow for 84 years, or she could have been 84 years old when this took place, okay? She was married for seven. He passes. What does she do? She spends her entire life, day and night, worshiping through fasting and prayer in the temple. Day and night. Now, fasting. Maybe, maybe some of you guys are not familiar with fasting, okay? Prayer, I think everybody in this room, I hope, has a little bit of a concept of prayer, but fasting. Literally, setting aside eating food, um, the most simplest way, setting aside eating food for a time and a purpose, okay? When we know her purpose and her time was day and night, regularly, she did this in the anticipation of the child, Jesus, coming. This is day eight. Day eight. She's been doing this for anywhere from 60 to 84 years. Worshiping. Praying. Fasting. Waiting for the redemption of Israel. How do I know that? Because the second part of hers is when she recognized Jesus, she gave thanks to God and spoke to him or spoke of him being Jesus to all who are waiting for the redemption of Israel. Now, let me tell you why I believe that Anna and Simeon are very valuable to this story. What was going on? Okay, other accounts we see uh, the Magi, these wise men, right, that were looking for this Jesus, for the Lord's Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, right? We, 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 we know from other accounts, they were searching. They go to King Herod. King Herod doesn't like that, that he calls upon his own prophets and people to tell him, hey, where is this taking place at? Ultimately, those people, the wise men go on and they find baby Jesus. We see the shepherds who are out in their fields whenever the angel came to them and told them about this baby that was born in Bethlehem and that they must go see. And they do. And we see these accounts. And we know that a lot was probably being said about this baby that was being born. There was probably some excitement because the Messiah and the Savior of the world was coming. But you know what I want to point out? She did this 84 years before that ever happened. She didn't wait for the last minute. She was in preparation in prayer. She was in preparation in fasting. She didn't wait just for everybody else to tell her that Jesus had arrived. She did it without ever seeing him preach a sermon. She did it without ever watching one person be healed. She did it without the Bible telling her about everything that Jesus had accomplished. She did it before he ever went to the cross and died for her sins. Why do I think it's important that we have a Simeon and an Anna in the Bible is their demonstration of their faith to listen to God, to worship God, to be prepared for God to come in the form of a baby. Which left me thinking, where are we in our preparation I'm not trying to make a comparison game to Anna because everybody in here, including myself, would probably fail in comparison to Anna and her preparation. She did all of those things, never seeing what Jesus done, but yet all of us have seen and heard and know the truth of what Christ has accomplished. Anna, 
she turns and she speaks to everyone that was waiting for the redemption of Israel. My question is, is there a place to turn to that I know of people that are waiting and anticipating Christ's return? Let me give you some examples of some New Testament scripture that I think would be very important to drive this point home. Hebrews 9, 26 through 28. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifices of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was, sac was sacrificed once to take away sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Waiting for him. Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the hope of salvation. He was waiting for the comfort of God who he was going to send, who made a promise. He was waiting for him for that moment so that way he could go to death knowing that God fulfilled the promise of the Christ. Anna was waiting for 84 years, at least 60 years, right? Somewhere in that range. She got married. She, she, she was seven years uh, wed before he died. But for a really long time, she was up in age. She was waiting, worshiping, praying, and fasting, and anticipating the one who was coming to redeem. And when she saw that baby at eight days of age, she spoke of him to everyone. That was waiting for the redemption. Is that the kind of conversations you were having? Are you ready and excited for the return of Jesus? I understand our schedules are busy. Pastor Sean, you don't understand what I do. I do. I am just as guilty. I love that I get to preach because in all reality, I get to tell myself that I'm not doing the things that I need to be doing in preparation for the Lord and his return. I love studying God's word because there's conviction that comes from it. I love that it is encouragement because in all reality, these things in this world that we are so distracted by, the conversations that entangle us, the day in and the day out, the grind. I understand it. I work a lot of jobs. I do a lot of things. I can make a lot of excuses. I'm just like everyone else. I believe that the reason that Luke wants us to know about Simeon and Anna so that way we know the certainty of the truth that we have been taught. Our lives should look different than everyone else around us. These people were recognized as devout followers righteous, full of the Spirit, walking into the temple in the Spirit. These are visual observations from outside. Testimony from, in, he may have sat down, Luke may have sat down and spoken to Simeon. He may have sat down and spoken to Anna. Now, more than likely, these were testimonies that were shared as direct witnesses to other apostles, possibly Paul, Peter, whatever it is, these are examples that he found to be important. Maybe people knew these people. He identifies Anna as what? As the daughter of Phineal, the tribe of Asher. There's these distinct details that he is making sure for preservation purposes and in this point that Theophilus will know with all certainty, the truth. Let me tell you this other passage real quick. It talks about the waiting. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured. This is, this is Paul, okay? 
Paul is literally, this is his exit game. This is right at the end of his time. And he's talking to Timothy. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. My commentary says this about the love, his appearing. All true believers, that their hearts are set upon the return of Christ. People in this story, Simeon and Anna, had their hearts turned to the Lord, anticipating his initial coming. They were ready for his appearing. I believe what we can learn is how they waited in anticipation for God can be demonstrated in our own lives and how we live out our faith on a regular basis. That way, we will have with all certainty an understanding of the truth that we need to have in our faith walk. Now, in closing, there was a psalm that was referenced, and I really thought it encompasses this moment very well. It's Psalms 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. It's funny that Luke uses the ends of the earth quote in Acts chapter 1 when he's talking about go into all of Samaria, Judea, and all those places and to the ends of the earth. Shout for the joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. They are rejoicing. The waters are singing. The mountains are crying out in anticipation of God to come and judge his people. It says it's full of joy. So many people in their own faith walk are terrified of judgment that is coming. And I would say if that is you today, you need to make things right with the Lord. Because in all reality, the message is a beautiful message of how God saves his people. He did all of the work for his glory. And he asked of us to what? Repent? Turn from our wicked ways? 
believe in Jesus, the Savior of the world, the one that Simeon and Anna are pointing to as the Redeemer and the Savior, the Anointed One? That's us today. My hope is we're waiting in anticipation, joy-filled, as the mountains and the seas are worshiping God in anticipation of the judgment that is coming. And I look out into a crowd, we're going to worship in a minute. What does your worship look like to God? I've heard so many different things, and I'm not trying to be judgmental of your worship, but it better enca encapsulate voices crying out. There better be joy in the worship, right? Like all of these things, when we see worship, these are real things. We see music, we see tambourines, all these things that are being brought out in these passages. Those things are to make a joyful noise to the Lord. So do not hide behind. Do not hide behind. I worship in a reverence that is silent. That, that is true. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not saying it's not true. I believe there's true, authentic reverence in worship, a respect of God and his greatness. But in all of that, he is crying out that we worship him. That means someday when you're falling on your face, if you think you're just silent in the presence of the Lord, they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. If you decide to worship today and that's all you got, I would love for you to put that to practice. Do not, do not let this testimony of Simeon and Anna go without being applied to our own lives and an understanding of the true worship that God desires for the people who are truly following him. These people knew God. Never knowing Jesus in all of those things that he accomplished, and we do. We know those things. We have so much to worship about in his anticipation of his come. That's going to be a great day, nothing that we have to be afraid of. If we have something to be afraid of, then we have some undealt stuff that needs to be laid before the Father who literally will grant you his grace and his mercy and meet you with love as he literally redeems his people. Not only the Jews, the Gentiles as well. That is the power of the gospel message. Romans 1.16, I already quoted it earlier. For all who believe. For all. I'm so glad you guys are here today to hear this message that I glazed over this week. I've read it many times. I read Luke 2 every Christmas. <laughs> My father in law taught me that. <laughs> Talking about a legacy learning from those who have gone before us. I want to encourage you today, no matter where you are, where you are, trust in God, trust in his ways, trust in his word, some of us, that means we have to respond. We have to respond. Because we're not walking out the joy of the Lord in the fullness. I get it. I get it. There's a lot going on. A lot of things that want our attention but God wants you to. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful testimony. We thank you, Lord God, for your word today. I pray for these next few minutes you will continue to deal with the hearts of those that you are moving in. 
Lord God, I pray for courage for those to respond. I pray for people to pray boldly and faithfully with those who are seeking you today. I, I pray for your peace to fall upon these people that make a decision today to follow you all of their lives. I pray, God, that you will continue to strengthen us to live lives in the manner of an Anna and a Simeon. God, I pray that you will open our eyes to the anticipation of Christ's final triumphal return. God, I don't want to be like those that turned from Christ that day on the cross. God, I want to be like those that are waiting and anticipating on his coming. Help us to grow in our understanding, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here in the next few minutes, we're going to worship together. I encourage you guys, as you heard Psalm 98, that you will worship as an individual who truly has a good and great view of your God. Some of you have probably already gotten your communion cups, the juice that represents the blood of Christ and the cracker that represents the body of Christ, which was poured out on your behalf as a propitiation of your sins. If you haven't gotten one, there's places on the side that you can do so and in the back. You take that at your own time. But for everyone else, when you are done with that, I encourage you to worship as someone who has been saved by the grace of God.